Hello, hi, this is Kim McCoy from ND Authors World and today I wanted to record this video um, to talk a wee bit about the impact that people can have and the reason for that is that this week it's the anniversary of our son Callum's death. He, um, it'll be 11 years um, this week and there's a lot of um, stuff been coming up for us thinking about the reason that Indie Authors World exists is that my husband Sinclair decided to write a book um, was really, you know, got into kind of really writing again and getting that book finished after Callum's death because life was too short not to do what he really wanted to do and he wanted to, to, to put a book out that was in memory um, of him. So The Little Detective was the very first book that was put out there and Indie Authors World kind of grew from that, from people asking for help effectively. Um, and so really Callum, although he's not with us, has continued to have an influence um, and, you know, just a whole lot of folk have got their books published because he's not here, which is a strange way of looking at life, um, but is one of the things that actually has helped us to I think to, to focus on the positives and to kind of keep moving forward. So today I wanted to, um, to catch up with one of our really special authors and that lady um, is Karen Finnegan and this is her book, it's called The Thirteen Stones and Karen actually won um, a competition. She was um, she was the winner of the Callum McLeod Memorial Publishing Prize that we set up um, in Callum's memory for what would have been his 21st birthday. So I'm going to just have a chat with Karen, welcome her to, you know, onto the, onto the video and have a chat just about what it felt like, I suppose, to, to kind of get that book out there and we're going to have a wee chat about the book. So welcome, Karen. Hello. <laughs> Lovely to see you. And Good to see you too. Um, and it's, you know, it's your book's been out for a while. It's absolutely fabulous. Honestly, this is a wonderful, wonderful story. Thanks. And um, what I'd like to know was, first of all, was how long had you held this kind of dream of of getting a book, you know, get, writing a book and getting it published? Um, probably all my life. I mean, I think I I just loved writing. Always wrote a lot when I was at school. Um, toyed around with sort of creative writing um, in sort of my early adulthood. Had messed about writing for such a long, long time. And uh, yeah, so I think it was always a dream. It was always one of those things. But I hadn't actually done anything about it. And you know, it's that whole thing about we can have all these dreams, but until we actually start taking action, then the universe cannot help us. I'm such a believer in that. So it's not just about having the dream. It's actually moving forward and doing something about it. So that story um, had been sketched around and sketched around for so many, um, you know, for quite a long time. And um, it was just that thing about actually just making it happen. And that's obviously when I saw uh, your competition and it just seemed like seize the day. Just, I changed it slightly. Um, I had written it originally in the third person and then when I heard about what saw your competition, read what you said, suddenly uh -uh, I have to change this and it became so much more powerful as written in the sort of the first person. Yep. Yeah. And I remember um, we, we had a lot of entries, you know, who, you know people who submitted um, books to us and we, you know, we had a team of people who were kind of reading, reading all these books and trying then to, to come up with a, you know, how, how are we going to choose a winner? You know, we had a panel of folk and it was, it was quite, um, it was quite a task. But everybody said how much, you know, that first, that, that first chapter, particularly your book, just, we were all hooked and we wanted to know more about the story. We wanted to know what would happen. And we loved the descriptions and we loved the, the feeling and the atmosphere that you created with that Thank book. You. Um, and that was it. it just really it really drew us in it absolutely mm -hmm. drew us in so yeah you know so whether it was serendipity whether it was the universe kind of conspiring to, yeah. um, to kind of get that book out whether Callum had a hand in it or not I know, know. I know. <laughs> um, it's funny because it, I mean the inspiration for it was really I love graveyards I've told you this story before I love graveyards I love I've lived beside graveyards quite a number of times I love walking around graveyards I love looking at gravestones and imagining the people and, and what they did 
in that particular graveyard that the book is, is starts off in and is set in is like a, a real graveyard in Lanark that I would go and wander about with my dog and wander around the gravestones <laughs> as you do and read the gravestones and just imagine stories and the, the view from that graveyard where you're looking across the town and there's the crunch of the gravel and the smell and the birds would all be flocking around and there's the old ruined buildings. I just I just loved that graveyard. <laughs> if you can say that. It's one of my favourites. <laughs> it became the inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> and I think to say everybody there's there's more than just a story about a graveyard and there's lots of there's lots of other things. It's not just thirteen kind of gravestones that we're talking about this book. There's there's a lot more to it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what was it like? So you'd had this dream for you know for a long time about writing yeah. the book and, and having a book, you know, done, as I like said, something that's been, been there most of your life. Yeah. What did it feel like for you when you actually got that book in your hand for the first time? What, what was it like? Um, I think honestly, it was so unreal. I don't think I really appreciated how um, how amazing it felt. I just, I think. It was just the weirdest experience. And for me, it was only, this probably sounds a bit sort of egotistical, but it was only when I realised that the book would actually be in all these major libraries around the UK forever. That's when it hit me. <laughs> Even having the book in my hand, I still felt a little bit sort of, just you know, it just didn't seem real. I remember looking at it. I, I mean, I was enthused. I loved it. But I just didn't feel it was me. I couldn't actually remember writing half of it. That's the weird thing. It, it, yeah, it's just a strange thing. It's only when I got a letter through saying, can you send me six copies? Because this is going into all these libraries. Suddenly I was like, oh, I'm a legacy. <laughs> yep, absolutely. You, you My words will go on. <laughs> That's it. It's sitting there. there it is, folks. You know, it's, it's, it. it's, it's in it. the British Library. It's in the, uh, the Library of Oxford. It's in the it's you know, Library. You know, so, yep. Um, library of Scotland. Library of Wales. Yep. <laughs> that that was the moment for me when suddenly it was like the power of words and the fact that I mean we're we're reading stuff that was written five hundred years ago, and and we'll be reading in five hundred years. People will be reading stuff that's written now. So there's something about the power of writing and the power of words that goes on and just transcends history. Yeah. So to be, I mean, I'm not for one minute thinking that somebody's going to read my book in 500 years. It was more just the idea that I was part of it, that there was the potential for that. That's, that was when it really hit me. <laughs> that was the big thing. And that was, the, that was like the dream come true aspect to things. When you realise the power of words and the power of a story, yeah. to sort of tell, just to shift people, to make them feel better about their lives. Yeah. Um, and so as, as an author, you feel good about writing it and you feel amazing when people want to talk to you about it and remember what you've written and it means something to them, just that all those books that I've ever read really mean something to me. Yeah, yeah. So. And I think that's, that's the thing about just the story as well, because you've written this, I mean, as a spiritual book. Yeah. If you like it, but yeah. but it's a fictional tale. Yes, we may have somebody else who wants to come and speak to you. If if the cat suddenly jumps up and says hello, <laughs> like, okay. just she's just come in and sort of me having at my feet here. Um, yeah, so that you know you've got this spiritual story, but you you have written it as um as this kind of fictional, mm -hmm. fictional tale. So what you know, I suppose why why did you why did you decide to kind of write it as this sort of story? Because I know that, that like you say, a lot of this, a lot of the concepts that are in here are things that you've you've talked about and you've kind of even taught in elements of stuff. Yes. So, but why why tell the, the kind of the, the story this way, you know, rather than than write a how-to guide? Well, that was the thing. Originally, my my thoughts were always that I was going to be writing a sort of self-help guide, a how to recover from grief, how to feel better, how to sort of change your life, all that kind of stuff. That was originally what I was thinking. But I had this idea to disguise all that as a story because if you think about all through it again, throughout history, we, we tell sort of morals and parables are all stories. And we get it from a story. So there was something in that idea of 
um, shifting it a little bit and rather than saying to somebody this will make you feel better rather than that it was this character was going through this shift and change and dealing with her grief but at the same point um, life just was a bit strange and she just wanted to understand a little bit more and there was an adventure around it so partly it was about taking the character and then taking the people who were reading it through this idea that I mean grief does come in waves mm -hmm. and it does move us and it changes us and it shifts us so there was all of that going on as well for me personally and I thought writing it as a story makes it much more accessible and also it's okay then, let's say, say, to be emotional, to cry when it's okay to cry as opposed to, you know, you'll get over it, it's fine, don't worry about it. Yeah, you go, you go through a stage for the character to go through the stages and for people to come around her and for all the good stuff that people tell you to do, but to do it in the way of a story. I felt as if that was a much more powerful but also gentler way to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it definitely came out, you know, having read it, I mean, I loved, and I loved it that there's because you've got you've got that element of of adventure in it as well. You know, it's not it's, it's, so you've got this spiritual um, journey. You've got the you know here we are. We've got Kirsty's life kind of unfolding around her. You know, everything that starts to happen. Yeah. You know, and and she she begins to be aware of a lot of things that um that she I suppose had just kind of blanked out stuff that was happening in, mm. in, around her. Yeah. But I think you also find that, don't you, that anyone, anyone that I know that's had a major spiritual shift, it's happened at times of real emotional hardship, real, real pain, because yeah. we don't grow as people by sitting watching the telly and keeping an easy and having an easy life. <laughs> you know, we can't, we can't learn, we can't experience from just reading it or just watching it. We actually have to um, experience the emotions. For an order for us to progress, I think, and just to grow spiritually. So there was something in that idea that we were, as a reader, you were being taken along by her growth. And but she was human. She's she's you know she goes up and down just the way grief hits people. Sometimes you're absolutely fine. Sometimes it hits you. Sometimes you're fine again. And all the good things that maybe would help you get through it, like friendship and a bit keeping yourself a little bit busy, maybe, and a little bit of humour. And cake, of course, there has to be cake <laughs> and be. tea. Are the yeah, big things. There always has to be cake. Although, and we ha yeah, and we just, I just want to just share a wee bit of a laugh because you know I've said to somebody that you, know, you read this book and, and people have gone the thirteen scones. Stones, people, not scones. But you know, if you want to try these thirteen <laughs> scones, then you know, have a go. <laughs> I'm going to do a recipe book next. <laughs> so. I mean, as as we're saying at the start here, you know, I'm keen to to kind of think about the impact that, that people have when when they're not here. You know, the, the ripples that kind of go out, and mm -hmm. you know, certainly, you know, the from you know, Calm's still having an impact in the world, even though yeah. he's not here. You know, and what I mean, I suppose, can you share how? readers have found your book have you had mm. any kind of feedback so that you know that, that, so that you can see the, the impact that this book has had on other people yeah I've had a, honestly I've had so much great feedback from this and people who um had maybe opened up slightly sort of were interested in a sort of spiritual journey took that from the book others called me well didn't call me they texted me sent me messages and um, basically saying to me that um you know, they, they were in their garden and they were thinking about the book and then a feather fell and they were thinking about their granny or they were thinking about their partner or people who'd passed away. Um, so, but felt good about it. So rather than having that fear mm -hmm. or that, you know, that overwhelming emotion, some people were saying to me, I actually felt okay because it was almost like they had a wry smile because they remembered in the book that this had happened to Kirsty. And it was like, oh, or people who've seen the scene, white moth, like white butterflies, white moths flying around and they're thinking that's strange. And then again, it reminds them of somebody that they've lost. So it's just that idea that they can follow, like they can follow a butterfly just for a few minutes, thinking about granny or thinking about dad or something. So a lot of people have told me that they've really found that very 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 powerful but also very gentle very releasing 
um, it's amazing the number of people. And what surprises me is not just women, but men as well. It's almost like it gives them a little bit of permission just for that moment to be in that space. So um, I, I found that really quite amazing because if I'd written a self-help book, I would have expected that kind of thing. But by writing it as a piece of fiction, as much as that's what I wanted, to actually to, for it to be validated by people was pretty incredible. It really was. Yeah. And even just for people to like it, <laughs> people to want to buy it, people to comment and send me messages saying how much they enjoyed it and when's the next one coming out. That's <laughs> like, that, that is amazing. That really is a big thing. Yeah, and we've just been talking, so when is the next one coming out then, Karen? Well, I'm <laughs> a little bit of sales pitch there. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, I'm ho I really hope it will be out before, the, uh, before Christmas. Um, and there's a reason for that, because the book is actually set around about the time of the winter solstice. Uh, so the second one just starts a week or two after the first one finishes. So it's just a bit of a continuation of that. And um, uh, yeah, and as I say, around about this winter solstice. So I'd love for the book to come out right before then, just so people, because it's a very much a winter book. It's not the kind of one I think you would sit on the, the beach <laughs> reading. It's all about winter, snow and ice and stuff like that. It's very cold. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, look out, folks. You know, this is it. You know, we've uh, Karen's promised we're we're almost there. So, um, we're uh, we're going to be looking at kind of publishing that very very shortly. So, please, you know, check out the chamber within, which will be the next one. And I'm sure that we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, there'll be lots of interest and stuff will come up on our Facebook page and stuff if you want to kind of check out there. So, just as before we finish off, Karen, I'd I'd like to say, you know, what advice would you give if you've got somebody sitting there at home watching this and thinking about, yeah, I've always wanted to write a book or mm -hmm. I've started writing a book or I've got stuff that I've, that I've got a book that I've written and I've just done nothing with. What, mm -hmm. what, would, what advice would you give them? Well, I suppose the main thing really with any kind of writing, I mean, I teach writing as well, is just do it. Get out of your head. Never write from your head. Write from your heart. Write from any other part of your body listen to that and see what that message they have to say don't don't listen to your head don't listen to those little voices that tell you you can't do it you don't have time to do it it's not going to be worth it anyway don't listen to any of that kind of stuff focus on your on your own self and your reasons for sharing that story um, and I think just write it just write it and then take action to get it out there and whether you self-publish or whether you send it to, you know, traditional publishers or whatever, just take action because sitting in your head or sitting in your, you know, I don't know, in your PC is not going to get it out there. You know, miracles can happen. I mean, look what happened to me. But there still had to be a little bit of action. I had to meet the universe a little bit you know, by actually sending it in. And there's that whole fear you have of um, people saying it's not good or people not liking it. And I think at that point, you just have to feel good about yourself. You've done it and not everyone does. Even yeah. though they say that everyone has a book in them, not everybody takes it to that next stage and actually gets it out there. So that's the big thing for us all. Yeah. Just, just do it. Just do it. That, exactly. Somebody's going to love it. <laughs> Karen's, Karen's advice definitely we would say as well you know just go on there and do it you know come you know come and talk to us come talk to our Facebook page come along we're in Watersons in Glasgow um, in Soggy Hall Street the last Sunday of the month come and meet some other writers you know that who've, who've actually got there got their books out there and um, listen to the, you know the, the stories of people talking about their books it will get you moving and you know create some more impact. We need more books so that, that, you know, your words are powerful and, you know, it, it's, it can make a difference. Whether it's a, you know, a fiction story that just sets somebody kind of thinking about something, whether you've written a how-to guide about something, whatever it is, you know, just, it's, it's really powerful, I think, mm -hmm. to kind of get it out there. So, um, and thank you, thank you, Karen, for sharing. Thank you for, you know, coming on and talking to us for, for this short video. Um, it touches my heart to know that, Callum's influence, um, you know, just permeates what we are doing with indie authors, and is you know is, is kind of making a difference. You know, if, if you know if it hadn't, we hadn't done the, the kind of publishing prize in his memory, then we might not have had your book, and you know, all and these people wouldn't have kind of you know been able to tell you telling you stories that you know. So, yeah. Um, 
So thank you, thank you so much for, for joining me, and um, good luck with that next book. If you have, but what you need to do is you need to go and get a copy of the Thirteen Thrones because you're going to have to read that one first before the Chamber Within comes out, and that's going to be very soon. So um, thank you, Karen, um, <laughs> and we'll we'll catch up soon. Lovely, so, thank you. Bye, bye folks. Hello and welcome. Um, this is Kim McLeod from Indie Authors World and I'm delighted to be joined on the couch today with Chris Tate. Um, Chris is the author of Diablo, um, The Fantastical Adventures of an Unloved Chess Piece. And the reason that I got Chris along to talk to us today is that Chris's book was um, published as um, the we had we did an, uh, an act of kindness challenge last year, and um, Chrissy's book was the one that we chose. She was nominated for that prize, and the book was published in memory of her son Callum. And this week it would be um, it's eleven years since Callum died, and we've been talking a lot about the impact that you can have, even you know after you're not here, and particularly if you've written something. I mean that your words are are then out for the rest of eternity, if it ends effectively. Um, so I wanted to have a wee chat with, with Chris because her book um, had been you know, published in Callum's memory. And so we're going to have a wee chat about the book and find out a wee bit about Chris. So, so welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for coming to join me today. Um, so first of all, tell us a wee bit about who is Diablo? Well, Diablo is supposed to be me. And because I've lived in a lot of places in Britain, I feel like a, a chess piece. And the things that happened to him that happened to me are similar to like Mr Bean. So I see him, he's supposed to be me, kind of similar to like Mr Bean or, or Willie. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so Diablo actually has a whole lot of adventures, I suppose, this journey that he kind of goes on. Um, can you tell us a wee bit about, about the journey and what happens with Well, he starts off, he wants to go to art college, but he's... Um, other chess pieces try to stop him, so he just goes anyway. And the chess pieces that they chase after him, and he runs and then he fires through the board and he lands on a monopoly board. And then he gets blamed for making it go bankrupt, so he then gets sent to a punch and duty cook kiss. And then he gets sent to jail. And then support workers go on a pilgrimage to look for him. And then he joins other board game counters to do tabletop role playing. <laughs> <laughs> this book is like nothing you have ever read. Um, it is uh, a, a real kind of mix, I think, of you know, there's sort of sort of po poetic kind of like pieces that are in there. Um, you've got quite surreal kind of storylines, but it is a magical adventure. I think that's what we would yeah. really see, isn't it? It's a kind of magical adventure. Yeah. Um, and your imagination and descriptions are so vivid, but it is, is as we've discussed before, that you, you've got, I suppose each of us have got a unique view in the world, yeah. but um, you know, you've, you've got your own particular way of you know, looking at the world, and, and as you were describing, how you've dealt with situations. And that's what you've actually taken and kind of created into, into this book, turned what you've known and kind of looked at how you would see things and turned it into this adventure. Okay. Um, so how does it feel now to actually see what you've had in your head and all these adventures and all the things that you've experienced actually now as a, as a book, as this book? How does it feel like? Well, it's very magical because it's one thing to get published, but it was even, an even more special feeling to have a graphic novel because I've always enjoyed comic books and graphic novels since I was a child. So it, um, it's kind of like, double the experience and yes it's lovely being published and having your book on the shelf and other people reading it it's very satisfying it's a very accomplishing feeling yeah, yeah. i want to show you just some of the some of the, the pictures that are in here because it's a graphic novel but a very different graphic novel i think because each of the pages um so as the story progresses you've got a very different style. There's the, there's the Monopoly board, as, as Chris was talking about. Um, and the, the journey, kind of, his journey unfolds with a range of different, very, very different images um, across the whole book. So um, it was a joy for us putting together, it was a challenge for us putting this book together because we really had to figure out how best to, to showcase your, 
yeah. your words um, because we loved, you know, loved the story and loved the concept of it. Um, so what have the reactions been as people have read it? Really lucky. I've had lots of positive feedback um, um, for children and adults, and they said that um, I've got unique uh, imagination. It's an unusual story. It's just very different. They can tell it's about me. It's been um, a very positive about the story and the pictures and the writing style. So I really appreciate the positive feedback I've had. Well, well deserved. Absolutely, definitely well okay. deserved. So what? impact would you like to have for this book? Well, I would like it to be um, a story that would inspire and comfort people, particularly ones that are different, and also that it could educate teenagers and influence them. That, that I would like it to be a, a positive message. So what, what we... Um do you think of where people are saying that they're different? What what particular um, issues and um, does Diablo have then that would that, that people would maybe identify with? Well, he's supposed to have a learning difficulty. He's meant to have Asperger's. So, if um, a young person or even an adult was on the autistic spectrum, or if they were vulnerable or dyslexic, or having some kind of difficulty, then they could read the book and it could. Um, maybe comfort them, stop them feeling lonely, um, identify with him and it could be yeah, something that could be like a I suppose like a, a role model for them to look up to. Yeah. And that's the thing was kinda of recognising that you're not alone and that that um because I mean as we said you've um, you've identified that you you have some of those you know some of those issues to, to challenge and, and deal with yourself and but that unique view of the world is what's allowed Diablo and this magical adventure really to be created. So um, so hopefully you know if there's anybody out there who's kind of feeling that they're maybe struggling a wee bit or they feel that because you are you look at the world slightly differently that you feel that you're you know you, you're maybe not understood. Neither was Diablo. But um, the story comes good at the end. <laughs> the story comes good at the end. It's like given too much of me, the story comes good at the end. So, um, what would you like to say to anybody else who's who's then maybe sitting there thinking that they might have a story themselves? They might have their unique take in the world, and they, you know maybe they've got an idea for something. Well, don't be cut off by negative criticism, and keep at it. Keep persevering. Write a book say write it a better day you could go to a writer's group and meet people and they could give you feedback and then they might give you names of publishers or competitions or links or networks like why that's why that could help you get published and you'll probably find that that's half the battle that makes it easier to get published and also um just um, have fun. The main thing is if you have fun, because the book was good fun to write, and I'm working on the sequel, and I found it very cathartic writing it. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's the thing, folks. You know, it's just anything's possible. You know, it's possible to kind of write and put the book together. Um, Self-publishing these days makes it a, an opportunity for you to kind of get a book out there that you don't have to. You don't have to go through the gatekeepers of a publisher who might again might not understand um, your your model of the world and how you see things and maybe not to see the potential um, in your book but there, there's you know there's so many ways to get your book out there um, and if anybody's interested in you know exploring whether they've got a story and whether their book could be you know could, sell, could be self-published or you want to make an impact with your story come and talk to us because you know we'll gladly you know have a conversation and and kind of maybe point you in the right direction um, and see if we can help you too so um I think I think Callum would lo Callum would have loved this story. I think um, I think it would have been um, it would have been something for him to kind of sit here. And he had a wonderful imagination, um, uh, and I'm sure that he would have loved he would have loved Diablo. And we were just delighted to have published this book um, in Callum's memory. So it is Diablo: the um, the fantastical adventures of an unloved chess piece by Chris Tate. It's available um, on. And all good booksellers, um, but you can get it online um, on Amazon, on uh, uh, Waterstones, um, on the Book Depository. Have a look; it's there. Um, you know, so go on, buy it. Um, if you really, it would be really great as well. You know, leave a review for Chris. Let her know what you think of it, um, and uh, that would be really cool. 
how can people get in touch with you? Have you got a Facebook page or a yes, and Twitter, and I've got a blog. The name of the blog is at the back of the book, and I've also got my author's website, and they're linked together. Yep. So, so there we go. You can check out Chris and uh, go and read her book. And thank you so much for um, for for joining us um, with this video. And uh, yep, go and make a difference. You create your own impact in the world. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>